everybody. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about, the Jews, proof of the existence of God. And what we're going to see this evening, God willing, is first of all that we can show that God exists. That God himself has set down a test by which we can see that he is. We can see that God has showed Israel what would happen in their future. He has declared to them what is going to come to pass. He has done things for Israel, which no one other than God could have done. We're going to see then the existence of God. We're going to see the way God's hand controls affairs. We're going to see how God moves nations to conform to his will. And we're going to see that God has a purpose, that the story hasn't ended. That there is a future work which will be performed in the earth. And we're going to see this from the word of God. A couple of passages on the screen. Generally that, that won't be the case. There will be references on the screen which we will look up. But a couple of passages just to start. Which show us that the Bible that we have before us is the word of God. That all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it means that God breathed it out. God gave people the words and they wrote them down. That's how God declares the Bible to have been formed. The second passage from 2nd of Peter chapter 1. Knowing this first. That no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And we're going to be thinking about prophecies this evening. And the point is that they didn't come because someone sat down and thought, well that would be nice to write that down. Or let's just take a guess at what's going to happen in the future. We can't do that. Or if we try to do that, we're inevitably wrong. These things came about because God put them down. And that's what we're going to show this evening. That there is a God who has written the Bible, who does exist, and who has called a people to be his, and has dictated their affairs. We're going to start with the reading that we just took in Isaiah chapter 43. Because in Isaiah chapter 43, God sets out this test. He, he, he sets out a trial, if you like. He, he puts this trial together. From verse 9 it says, Let all the nations be gathered together, let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified, or let them hear and say it is truth. So the point is, you're going to come together and we're going to bring out witnesses and we're going to see who's right. And God says in verse 10, Ye are my witnesses. And, and if we went back to the beginning of the chapter, we'd see that God is speaking to Jacob and Israel. He's speaking to the Jews, his people. And he says in verse 10, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. That there is a God. And that the God who wrote the Bible is the supreme being, the creator, the great God. Before me, he says, there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no saviour. I have declared and have saved and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. So if we're going to question whether there is a God, whether there is a controlling being, whether there is a great power in the universe, the creator of the heavens and the earth, God sets a test and says, there's my people, look at them. 
And it's not just in Isaiah 43. If you come over to Isaiah chapter 44 and have a look at verse 6. Isaiah 44 and verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And who, as I, shall call, and shall declare it, and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people, and the things that are coming, and shall come. Let them show unto them. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. To show the existence of God, we need to look to his people. We need to look to the nation of Israel, the Jews. And we're going to do that this evening. We're going to look through their history. We're going to see the way in which God revealed things to them about what was going to happen in the future. And then we're going to see how that did happen. And we're going to show that that must have been by the hand of God. That there is no other way in which the history of Israel could have unfolded other than by God being in control. And that therefore we can say that God does exist. Because this nation is an impossible nation without the intervention of God. And we're going to start in Genesis chapter 12, please. We're going to come and have a look at Genesis 12 and verse 1. Genesis 12 and verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And so the record of the nation of Israel starts with one man, starts with this man called Abram, who we're going to read of again, and whose name was changed to Abraham. But this man Abram was called out by God from the country in which he dwelt. And God made him promises. And one of the promises was, the first promise was, in verse 2, I will make of thee a great nation. And the promise of God was that Abraham or Abraham would have a nation come from him. And to spoil the end a little bit, that nation was Israel. But God made these promises on the basis that Abraham would leave where he was and come away. And so in verse 4, we're told that Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. Now the land of Canaan is the area of land that now we call Israel and Palestine. That is the area into which they came. So God had said, if you come out of your country and go to the place that I will show you, then these will be the blessings that I will give you. And one of them is, there will be a nation from you. And Abraham did it. And he came into this land. And in Genesis chapter 13 and verse 14... Abraham is still there, in the land. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, north and south, and east and west. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. 
Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. And so God told Abraham, once he was in that land, that that land was his. And that he and his family would dwell in that land. That he could walk up and down it, he could walk across it, and it would be his land. And that was the promise that God made to Abram and to Abram's family after them. Now come across again another couple of chapters to Genesis chapter 15 and have a look at verse 13. Because something else was then going to happen. In verse 13 of Genesis chapter 15, God says to Abram, Now of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them. Now this was their land. God had given it to them. <coughs> the land that Abram was in, the land of Canaan, Israel as we know it today, was their land. But God says they're going to go out. Thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them. And they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. But, verse 16, in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. Now remember that. The fourth generation is important. But God has told Abraham. I'm going to make a nation of you. I'm going to give them this land, but they're going to go out of it. They're going to go and serve another nation that they don't know. And then they're going to come back again after four generations. And Genesis chapter 46 picks up the record. Genesis chapter 46. And verse 1, we are told about Israel. Now this is Israel the man from whom the name comes and from whom the nation was born. Israel was Abram's grandson. Abram had a son called Isaac. Isaac had a son called Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And Israel, we are told, in Genesis 46 and verse 1, took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here am I. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt. For I will there make of thee a great nation. And so Israel took his family. He'd come down in verse 1 to Beersheba. And he carried on down into Egypt. Because of a famine in the land of Israel. Just as God had told Abram. Your seed will go down into a land that is not theirs. And just note verse 8. These are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Jacob and his sons. Reuben, Jacob's firstborn. And the sons of Reuben. And in verse 11, we're told about the sons of Levi. Gershon, Kohath and Merari. So Israel went down into the land. Israel, the man and his family, the, the beginnings of the nation of Israel, went down from the land of Canaan into Egypt. We now come across a few more pages to Exodus in chapter 1. We're told in Exodus chapter 1, now the children of Israel were in the land of Egypt. In verse 1 it says, these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Every man in his household came with Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi and Judah. So Levi came down into the land. 
And there was in verse 8 a new king over Egypt. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. You remember what God had said to Jacob? Don't be afraid to go down into Egypt because I'm going to make of you a great nation. And now it's happened and there's a new king and he's looking around and saying, well, there's a lot of them. Come on, he says in verse 10. Let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us and so get them up out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burden. Just as God had told Abram back in Genesis chapter 15. In Genesis chapter 15, God told Abram they'll go down into a land which is not theirs and they will be afflicted there. And here in Exodus chapter 1, we are told about the king of Egypt who afflicted the nation, the great and numerous nation of Israel. And after four generations, God said, they'll come out four generations. Exodus chapter 1 verse 2 told us that Levi went down. And after Levi, Levi's son was called Kohath. And Kohath had a son called Amram. And Amram had a son called Moses. And in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 7, God said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. And have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And to bring them up out of that land. Unto a good land. And a large. Unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Unto the place of the Canaanites. They are going to go back to their own land. And so just as God had promised... <coughs> Abram had a son, and Abram's son had a son, and that son was Jacob, and that Jacob became Israel, and Israel became a great nation, but they became a great nation in a land that wasn't theirs, in servitude, in captivity, in Egypt. It's not the normal way of things, is it? Without the hand of God directing affairs I think we could confidently say that the nation of Israel would not even have started up that this man and his family who came down into Egypt would never have become a nation would never have kept themselves separate from the other servile nations in Egypt and would never have thought to have gone back up to the place where their father four generations ago had come from. But God was in control. And God was directing affairs. And Israel did come out. And they left Egypt. And they went up from Egypt into the wilderness. In preparation to go into the land of Israel. And in the wilderness. They were given the book. The law that we call the book of Deuteronomy. I want you to come to Deuteronomy in chapter 28. And we're going to keep coming back to Deuteronomy 28. Because what Deuteronomy 28 does. Is set out the history of the nation of Israel. In Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 1, God says, It shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and these blessings shall come on thee. And from verse 3 down to verse 14, there is a list of the things that would happen to them if they were faithful. If they believed and did what God had said. But in verse 15 it says. It shall come to pass if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. 
to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. And from verse 16 down through the chapter, God reels off curse after curse that would come on the nation of Israel if they didn't do what he said. And that list of curses acts as a history of the nation of Israel. And so what we're going to do, we're going to jump in to pick out some of the, the more extreme events which happened to Israel. And we're going to see that they happened by the hand of God. Because back in Deuteronomy 28, God had said, if this is what you do, this is what will happen. We'll see that they did, and it did. But God brought about the events in the history of the nation of Israel. And that there is no other explanation for how they came to pass. So we're going to begin in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 36. In verse 36... It says, the Lord shall bring thee and thy king which thou shalt set over thee. Now, it's important to note at this point, they, there wasn't a king. There was Moses who was the leader of the nation of Israel. There was Joshua who was his second who would take over command when Moses died and who would bring the nation of Israel into the land. They weren't called kings. They weren't considered kings. There was a period when Israel were in the land and they had judges who judged over them. The last of these judges was Samuel. And in the life of Samuel, we read in the book of Samuel that we aren't going to go to this evening, the nation of Israel said, we want a king. Like all the other king nations, <coughs> they've got kings and they're going to battle with them and it seems to do them all right. We would like a king. But at this point, when Deuteronomy 28 was being given... Before Israel had ever gone into the land, there was no king. But there it is. The Lord shall bring thee, and thy king, which thou shalt set over thee, unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known. And there shalt thou serve other gods, wood and stone, and thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb and a byword. Among all the nations, whither the Lord shall lead thee. So there were going to be in the land, the curses previous to this have been curses which relate to Israel in the land. They were going to spend a period of time in the land. But they were going to come out. God was going to remove them. God would bring them and their king and take them to another nation they would go into captivity so come forward to second of chronicles chapter 33 and let's see that this is exactly what happened in second of chronicles chapter 33 we have the record of the history of a man called manasseh the son of Hezekiah. And we are told in verse 2 that Manasseh did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Manasseh did very wickedly. And in verse 9... We are told, so Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err, and to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spoke to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not listen. And so, a few chapters further on, in 2nd of Chronicles in chapter 36 
we are told about Nebuchadnezzar. That's his face you can see. An engraving of a coin with his face and the inscription Nebuchadnezzar around the edge of it. And in verse 6 we're told of 2 Chronicles 36. Against him came up Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and bound him in fetters. This is the king of Israel. To carry him to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also carried up the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in his temple at Babylon. Remember what Deuteronomy 28 verse 36 and 37 had said, I will take thee and the king whom thou wilt set over thee. And here he is, verse 5, it was Jehoiakim whom Nebuchadnezzar bound in fetters and carried away. In verse 15 of 2 Chronicles 36, the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place, that they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no more remedy. Deuteronomy 28 had said, if you do good, then these things will happen to you. If you do evil, then these curses will come upon you. One of the curses was, you will be taken away, you and your king. And here it was, coming to pass, happening exactly as God had said. Therefore, in verse 17 of 2 Chronicles 36, he brought upon them the king of the Chaldeans, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small. And they, in verse 19, burnt the house of God, and brake down the wall of Jerusalem, and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire, and destroyed all the goodly vessels. And them that had escaped from the sword, carried he away to Babylon where they were servants to him and his sons. God had said that this is what's going to happen. And it did. It did happen. Just as God had told them it would back in Deuteronomy 28. Israel gone out of the land, removed by Nebuchadnezzar, taken into captivity in Babylon. And surely that was the end. A nation had been removed from its land. Surely that was the end. But no. I want you to come back to Deuteronomy chapter 28. I want you to keep something right at the end of 2 Chronicles 36. Keep a hand or something there. We'll be flicking back to that. But come back to Deuteronomy 28. And because I forgot to tell you before, if you keep something in Deuteronomy 28 as well, because we're going to keep coming back to Deuteronomy 28. Because in Deuteronomy 28, verses 36 and 37, God says, I'm going to bring you out of the land. But in verse 38 of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, Thou shalt carry much seed out into the field, and shalt gather but little in, for the locusts shall consume it. Thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but shalt neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worms shall eat them. Thou shalt have olive trees throughout all thy coasts, but thou shalt not anoint thyself with the oil, for thine olive shall cast his fruit. After they had gone into captivity, there are another set of curses which imply, and say in verse 40, that Israel would go back to their land. Because their curses on their seed in their field, on the vineyards, on the olive trees, throughout all thy coasts, within thy borders, is what that means. <coughs> so keeping something in Deuteronomy 28, come back to Ezra. Write it well. Come back to Second Chronicles chapter 36, where the next book we find is the book of Ezra. And have a look at chapter 1. Because in Ezra 1 and verse 1 we are told, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, 
that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build them a house at Jerusalem which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in, his, in Jerusalem. So, roughly 70 years after Israel had been removed from their land, Babylon had fallen, and an empire ruled by Medes and Persians, had risen up. And one of their kings, a man called Cyrus, decided it was time to let Israel go back. And so 70 years after being removed from their land, there was still a distinct group of people who would call themselves Israelites, who would return back to their own land and populate it again. It's a remarkable thing. But it happened. And it's just as God had said back in Deuteronomy 28. Don't turn back there, but in Deuteronomy 28, remember it said, Thou shalt carry much seed out into the field, and shalt gather but little in. So when you go back to the land, you're going to plant a lot, but not a lot's going to come back. Now come and have a look at the very small book of Haggai. Very close to the end of the Old Testament. The prophecy of Haggai <clears throat> and chapter 1. Haggai was writing at the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra, in Ezra chapter 5, actually refers to Haggai. So he was prophesying at this time when Israel had gone back to the land, having been in the Babylonian and then the Medo-Persian empires. But just note what the situation was in the time of Haggai. Verse 6. Ye have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. It is exactly the situation that Deuteronomy 28 prophesied. Because Israel was still not serving God. And God, all the way back, many, well, over a thousand years previous to this point in history had told Moses that this is what was going to happen. Nothing other than God could have done that. Just looking at the history of the nation of Israel is enough to show us that God exists. Come back and have another look at Deuteronomy chapter 28. We're going to move on in history and see what happened next. Because Israel came back into their land. <coughs> Thank you, Stuart. Israel came back into their land, as Ezra told us, as was prophesied by Deuteronomy 28. But in, chapter, in Deuteronomy 28 and verse 47, they were told, Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart, for the abundance of all things, therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger, and in thirst, and in nakedness, and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck, until he have destroyed thee. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favour to 
the young. And he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee either corn, wine, or oil, or the increase of thy kind, or the... And it goes on. They were going to be subjugated. They were going to be brought low under a nation, it says in verse 49, which will come from far, from the end of the earth. They were going to be in subjection to that nation until, in verse 63, it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught. And ye shall be plucked from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. There was going to come a time when Israel again would be removed, would be taken out of their land. They were going to spend a period in subjection and then they were going to be taken away. Now come and have a look at Luke and chapter 21. We are going to come back to Deuteronomy 28. So if you haven't lost it already, keep something there. But in Luke chapter 21... The time of the Lord Jesus Christ, when Israel was suffering under the subjugation of the Romans, were a Roman province under a Roman governor. In verse 5 of Luke chapter 21. And as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, Jesus said... As for these things which ye behold, the days will come in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And in verse 20, Jesus told them, When ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Verse 24 says, They shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. <coughs> and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So Jesus confirms for us what we read in Deuteronomy 28. There was a period when Israel were in subjection under a nation, the nation of the, well, the empire of Rome, when they were not in control of their own lives, they were not in control of their own government, when they had to serve another people. And there would come a time when that nation would remove them would take them out of the land. In Deuteronomy 28, God said, Ye shall be plucked from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. God would take them away again. And Jesus says the same thing. They're going to be led away captive into all nations. And these two men, the two men on the screen, are the emperor who became emperor of Vespasian and his son, who at this, well, at the point at which Jerusalem was destroyed was General Titus, who also became Emperor Titus. Vespasian came against Jerusalem in AD 66 because the Jews were so fed up with the, the hard treatment which they faced and, and, and the, the difference in the treatment which they faced compared to the Greeks who were up in the north of the land. The Jews had revolted because of that. And this man came down, he swept through the north of the land, conquered it, destroyed it, plundered it for all he could take, and came down against Jerusalem. And he besieged Jerusalem. Now if a Roman army besieged your town, there wasn't a lot you could do, and there wasn't any hope of anything ever happening other than you surrendering. It was the end. But news of other things occurring in the rest of the empire 
caused this man, who wasn't an emperor at the time, to break his siege. To remove himself from Jerusalem and to go and fight another man to ultimately become emperor. And so when Jesus said, when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. The people in his day wouldn't have understood. <clears throat> when you besieged a city, you didn't let people flee to the mountains. That was the point. But in this case there was an opportunity. A time when people could remove themselves from Jerusalem. Because Jesus was saying they're going to come back. They'll leave, but they're going to return. And under Vespasian's son, Titus, in AD 70, that's exactly what happened. Titus came, Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was burnt, the stones which Jesus said would be thrown down were thrown down. There was a great slaughter. And this was all despite the fact that Titus himself had expressly forbidden it. He told the, the, his, his soldiers that they weren't to destroy. The temple was a great building. The, the riches within the temple were wonderful. The, the, the plunder which could be gained was great. The building itself was remarkable. They didn't want to destroy it. But the Roman soldiers were so incensed by the attitude and the behaviour of the Jews that they refused to be held back. They torched the temple and they pulled down the stones. Because God had said that was what was going to happen. Because in Deuteronomy 28, God said that if you're not, don't do what I say, I will take you out of the land. And I will take you out of the land again. And it happened. And it happened again. And when Jesus said these stones are going to be thrown down, it didn't matter what Titus said. They were thrown down. Because the God who is revealed in the Bible exists and was in control of these things. And so we have <clears throat> historical artifacts of this. This is the Arch of Titus in Rome, built to commemorate the victory which Titus gained, the, the, the great victory which he gained. This is a relief within the Arch of Titus which shows them taking away the things from the temple and removing them and parading them through Rome in recognition of the fact that they had gained a great victory. And Israel was scattered Romans renamed Jerusalem and made sure that no Jews would ever go back. <coughs> but this was still not the end. It wasn't the end back in Deuteronomy 28, was it? We haven't reached the end of the chapter. Come back to Deuteronomy chapter 28. The last time we'll go here this evening. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse... 64 The Lord shall scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth even unto the other end and there thou shalt serve other gods which neither thou nor thy fathers have known even wood and stone and among these nations shalt thou find no ease neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest <laughs> But the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart and failing of eyes and sorrow of mind. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee. And thou shalt fear day and night and shalt have none assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt say, with God it were even. And at even thou shalt say, with God it were morning. For the fear of thine heart wherewith thou shalt fear. The nation weren't going to go away. The Jews, the people of God weren't going to disappear. They were going to move from nation to nation. They were going to be moved on because people hated them and persecuted them. Time after time, nations made decrees and laws that meant Jews couldn't be in their land. 
back in the 1300s, England did. Because people like to pin hideous crimes on the Jews. And ultimately it would get too much, and so they would be moved on from the nation where they were, and they'd have to go somewhere else. The sole of their foot would have no rest, because no one would have them. And that happened for thousands of years. They wandered through mostly Europe. Certain times they went across to Asia. There was nowhere for them. And it came to a head, didn't it? In fairly recent history. About 70 years ago. These are child survivors of a concentration camp being brought out and liberated. The ultimate expression of the way that the Jews had led their life was the wholesale slaughter which the Second World War brought on them. And God had said that that would be the case. But God also showed that they would still exist. That there was still a people who would call themselves Jews. Who would long to be a nation. And though they had wandered through foreign lands... They never were assimilated into those lands. They never became part of those lands. Though they had seen off their enemies. The Babylonians, the Medes and the Persians. The Grecian Empire has been removed. The Roman Empire doesn't exist anymore. The nations that God drove out of the land for them. Back in the early pages of their history. Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, they've all been destroyed. There is no hint of them anymore. But there are Jews. And just come and have a look at Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel in chapter 11. Because God was with his people. Naturally speaking, it shouldn't be the case that there is a nation of Israel anymore. Twice they've been completely removed from the land that they called theirs. But in Ezekiel chapter 11 and verse 16, God says, Although I have cast them far off among the heathen, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. Therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people, and assemble you out of the countries where ye have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And there has been a movement, or there was a movement, to return Israel, to form a state of Israel again, to bring back a nation which would call itself the nation of Israel. And history tells us that there were a number of options for them to return back to. There were a number of places that they could have gone. There were parcels of land offered to this group of people and said, this can be yours. You want a nation? You can have this plot of land. But God had said, I will give you the land of Israel. Not another part of the earth, but the part that I promised to Abraham all the way back at the beginning of the history of Israel. 
And so they did, didn't they? They came back and the state of Israel was born and in the earth today there is a nation which calls itself Israel in the land that was promised to their fathers against all odds, against all plausibility. They were brought back. But that still isn't the end. Because God still hasn't performed all that he promised, has he? Do you remember what it said back in Genesis chapter 12? Let's go back to Genesis. Genesis 13, I think, actually. God said in Genesis chapter 13 and verse 14 to Abram, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, north and south and east and west, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. So there's still a future. There's still something to happen, because Abram doesn't have the land now. It isn't it currently in his possession. And yet it was promised to him, and it was promised to him forever by God. And we have seen that when God makes a promise, it will happen. Just come forward to Genesis chapter 17. Have a look at verse 7. I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant. To be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. So Genesis 13 and Genesis 17 both say that Abraham and his seed will dwell in the land of Israel forever and it hasn't happened yet so we can be certain that God will intervene again that there will come to pass a time when Abraham will be brought back from the dead and given possession of that land which is Israel in Palestine today. Because we have seen, haven't we, by looking at the nation of Israel, that there is a God. There is no other explanation for the events which have happened to Israel and the way in which they were mapped out thousands of years before they happened. God must exist and he must have been the person who wrote this book and who laid down these things because no man could have done that. And God has promised that Abraham and his seed will possess the land forever. And we can be part of that. Come and have a look at Galatians in chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27 says, For as many of you as have been baptised into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And what that's saying is that in terms of the hope that God laid out to Abraham for everlasting life, on the earth and for a possession of the land. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Greek. It doesn't matter if you're bond or free. It doesn't matter if you're male or female. 
they want that hope is available to all. Because if you've been baptised, it says in verse 27, you're baptised into Christ. And if in verse 29, you be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The hope and the promise that was made to Abraham is made to all those who recognise that God does exist. All those who see that God has chosen his people. That he declared that they would be the witnesses to his existence. That they would not pass out of history. But that though extraordinary things happen to them, they would continue to exist to show that he continues to exist. And all that God said would happen to them has come to pass. So surely what God says will happen in the future. The hope that God set out for Abraham right at the beginning is the hope that is set out for us now. And we know that with such a God it will happen.